talk is going to be by uh, Clementine Maurice from Graz University of Technology, uh, describing a work of, uh, of great technical depth uh, and also uh, with a Grammy Award winning paper title. Uh, hello from the other side, SSH over robust cache covert channels in the cloud. So hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Clementine Maurice, and I'm going to present our work, Hello from the Other Side, SSH of a Robust Cache Cover Channels in the Cloud. And this is the work that I've done with my colleagues at Graz University of Technology in Austria. So first, um, let me present to you the outline. So I will be talking about cache cover channels. So what are they? Also, how do we get a cover channel working in the cloud? How do we get a cover channel working in a noisy environment? And finally, what can we do with such a cover channel? So I will be talking about a lot of CPU caches. So first, what are they for? Uh, the idea is that we have main memory that is really slow compared to the CPU. Uh, so we have caches that prefer frequently used data. And every data access goes through the cache. And caches are transparent to the operating system and the software. So um, on Intel CPUs, you have uh, a hierarchy of different levels of caches with usually several cores. So you have usually three levels of caches. Uh, level one and level two are private to each core, which means that core zero can only access its level one and its level two. But then you have the last level cache uh, that is divided into slices, so as many slices as cores. Uh, but all these slices are shared across cores, so uh, core zero can access slice zero, one, two, and three. Uh, this level of cache is inclusive, meaning that everybody, everything that is um, in level one and level two will also be in this last level cache. And finally, we have a hash function that maps a physical address to a slice. And this function was not documented, but we have also reversed engineering. Uh, so nowadays, we have set associative caches. So they work like this. We have data that is loaded in a specific set, depending on its address, so a few address bits. Um, then we have several ways per set, so here four ways. And then we have a cache line that is loaded in a specific way, and that depends only on the replacement policy. So the replacement policy basically makes room uh, for, makes, decides which, which cache line to evict to make room for the new one. And the important thing is that we have timing differences of, um, uh, sorry, for uh, data. So if you have data that is present in the cache, we call it a cache hit. And here you can see that it will roughly take between uh, 50 and uh, 100 uh, um, CPU cycle. And if data is not present in the cache, then it's called a cache miss. And here you can see that it will, it will never take below 200 CPU cycles. And this is the, this kind of timing differences that we're going to use in cache attacks. Um, so for cache attacks, you have um, cover channels and side channels. So here I will only talk uh, about cover channels. So the idea of cover channels is that um, you have two processes that are communicating with each other, even though they are really not allowed to do so. So an idea is that if you have uh, two processes in two different virtual machines, uh, it, there should be a logical isolation, so done by the hypervisor, and they should not be able to communicate with each other. Uh, and they will use here a cover channel to uh, bypass this limitation. So in the literature, we have several uh, cache-based cover channels. And basically, they all stop working when there's too much noise on the machine. And usually, we have this um, future work session that says, just use error correcting codes. And yeah, we wanted to see if we can actually do that. If it works, what are the implications? So I will talk about um, this technique that is called prime and probe. Um, so it's a cache attack technique in which the attacker knows which cache set uh, the victim accessed and not the contents. Um, so it can be used both for cover channels and also um, side channel attacks. Uh, it works across CPU cores uh, because this, it targets the last level cache that is shared across all cores. And very important, it does not need any shared memory as uh, some other cache attacks. So uh, for example, you don't need any memory duplication. And that means that it will work across virtual machines in the cloud, uh, for example, on Amazon EC2. So I will present to you now this general technique, Prime and Probe. Uh, so the idea is that we first have the attacker that primes. That means it's filling one cache set. So here we really do not have any kind of shared memory. Then uh, the victim is going to um, load some data. So it's going to evict the cache lines of the attacker while running. So here it evicted one cache line of the attacker. Here now it evicts another cache line. 
And now what the attacker wants to know is whether or not uh, the victim access this particular cache set. So to do so is going to access, so probe, its own data to determine if the set has been accessed. So for the first cache line, it's going to be a fast access because data is still in the cache. It has not been evicted by the victim. And on the second access, it's going to be a slow access because uh, data has been evicted by the victim, and therefore it, now it has to be re retrieved from the DRAM, which is slow. So when we're there, uh, the attacker knows that uh, the victim accessed this particular cache set. And this is what we're going to use for the cover channel. So now why can't we just actually just use error correcting codes? Uh, if we have a transmission without errors, it basically goes like this. We have the sender that sends zeros and one, the receiver receives this exact same thing, everybody's happy. Now it can happen that if we have noise on the cache, um, sometimes a zero is going to be replaced by a one. So this is just a substitution error which is actually still okay. Not the real problem comes if we have the sender and the receiver that is not scheduled at the same time. So if we have just a sender that is uh, descheduled, um, then this, the receiver actually does not know that and is going to think that the sender just sends some zeros there. And it leads to insertion errors. Now if the receiver is descheduled, uh, again the sender does not know that, uh, it just continues to send and the bits are just lost. So we have deletion errors. So we constructed a um, cover channel in two layers. So first, a physical layer that transmits the words as a sequence of zeros and ones, and it also deals with desynchronization errors. And then we have this data link layer that divide, divides data to transmit um, into packets and also corrects the remaining errors. So this physical layer. Uh, to send the zeros and ones, the sender and the receiver have to agree on one set, just as I've been telling you before. Um, so the idea that the receiver is going to probe this set continuously, it does that all the time. Now, if the sender wants to transmit a zero, uh, well, the sender just does nothing, and the receiver is still going to probe the, um, the, the cache set, and the lines will still be in the cache because they have never been evicted, and it's going to be a fast access. Now, if the sender wants to transmit one, it's going to access the addresses in the set, which will evict the lines of the receiver, and therefore it will be a slow access. So we have a zero fast access and one slow access. Um, so we need to have a set of addresses that fall into the same cache set and the same slices for the sender and the receiver. The problem is that the slice uh, number depends on all bits of the physical address, and we don't really know all these bits. Uh, so if we use uh, two megabyte pages, then we actually have some bits that are, um, we can control which cache set we, we are going to target, and we can build a set of addresses that are in the same cache set in the same slice, but with, without knowing which slice it is. So we cannot compute this slice, we cannot compute this label. So um, to basically have the sender and the receiver agree on the channel, uh, we did a jamming agreement which works like this. So we have the sender, which has some eviction sets that are labeled, and the receiver, which has some eviction sets that are not labeled. And what we want is to, to have the receiver have uh, labels on this, so they, that they really agree um, on the cache sets. So the sender is first going to uh, prime his first eviction set. Then the receiver also does the same for his first eviction set. Uh, here, it doesn't go into the same cache set. Uh, so then the sender is going to probe. Uh, it's going to be a fast access, which means that the receiver did not uh, evict its line. So here the sender knows that they did not agree on this channel. Now the receiver does the same, it's going to be a fast access, so the receiver knows that they did not agree on this channel. So they have to try again. So the sender tries again to prime his first eviction set. Uh, the receiver now does the same for the second. Uh, it's the fast access for the sender, so they did not agree on the channel. Same goes for the receiver. They try again with the first set of the sender, now the third set of the receiver. They still did not agree. Uh, same goes for the receiver. And now again, the first set of the sender and the fourth set of the receiver. And here it goes into the same cache set, really. And uh, what happens is that the receiver evicted all the lines of the sender. So now when the sender probes these lines, it's going to be a slow access, so they know that they did agree on this cache set. And same goes for the receiver, uh, which 
then his line has been evicted by the sender, so he knows that um, they did agree. So now we have this first label. Um, we do the same for all of them, which I'm not going to repeat here because it will be really slow. And now they agreed on all the channels. So we can try and send our first image. So this is a bit psychedelic. Uh, here it was supposed to be a butterfly, but what you actually see is all the synchronization errors and all the bits that have been shifted, and it results in this really psychedelic image. So we have synchronization errors. We have to do something about that. Uh, it's still our physical layer that does that. So we have our physical layer word that we chose to be 12 bits of data. And we handle the deletion errors with a request to send scheme that also serves as acknowledgement. So we have three bits of sequence number that are appended to the physical layer, to the data. And for request, uh, we have um, the sequence number that is encoded. Uh, so that's another seven bits. Now for the zero insertion errors, uh, we, use, uh, we use an error detection code that is called Berger codes. And what it does, it appends the number of zeros in the word uh, to itself. So it has a very nice property that a word just cannot consist only of zeros. If you have only zeros, then you append the number of zeros, which is obviously not zeros. And if you have no zeros, then it's already good. So basically, if we have received a word that is all zeros, we can um, see immediately that it was um, um, a mistake. So we had this image, and now this is actually what we receive. Uh, so I'm not sure that you can see very much here. Um, we, if, you, if we, we zoom, we can see that we still have uh, some errors. So this is not uh, now the data link layer that uh, handles these remaining errors with some error correction. So we used uh, read Solomon codes for that to correct the remaining errors. And we used the uh, read Solomon word size, uh, same size as the physical layer word size, so 12 bits. Now we do not care at all about the sequence number and error detection codes of the physical layer word. And that means that we have a packet size um, that is for certain uh, read solomon words. And if we have, for example, 10% error correcting codes, then we will have uh, these 400 words of parity. And now if we transmit the image again, it's our clear butterfly, and everything is fine. So we evaluated it a bit better than just sending butterflies. Um, so first with a native environment, and then Using this um, uh, scheme, then we have an error rate that is 0%, and the bit rate uh, was uh, 75 kilobytes per second. Uh, then we tried to add some noise. Um, so we added some uh, stress on the memory, and you can see that basically the bit rate is going to drop to uh, 36 kilobytes per second, but still the error rate is uh, 0%. Um, now we also tried that on Amazon EC2. So we had two instances on the same physical machine, and we wanted to um, use this cover channel between them. So in this case, uh, without any noise, we had uh, 45 kilobytes per second. And then we basically unleashed all the noise that we could think of uh, to see if the cover channel would still work. So we also had a third virtual machine um, on the same physical machine. Uh, we tried running web servers, stress uh, on the sender VM, on the receiver VM, web server on all VMs, et cetera. The worst case was uh, actually a stress M8 on the third VM. And the worst bit rate that we had here was 34 uh, kilobytes per second. But still, in all cases, um, error rate was still 0%. So basically, now we have this really perfect cover channel. It's almost like uh, we had a network between these uh, virtual machines. So we built an SSH connection uh, between them. Basically, we used uh, sockets for our TCP clients and TCP server, and then the actual zeros and ones were uh, transmitted with the cover channel through the last level cache. Uh, so we also evaluated it, um, how robust that was. Um, again, on between two instances on Amazon EC2. Uh, so it's really stable for pretty much all cases. Um, the worst case was stress M1 on the server side, uh, in which case we actually had some error, and as, as soon as you have one error on this SSH connection, then the connection just drops. Uh, so in this case, that wasn't stable. But we also tried with Telnet that works with some occasional corrected bytes, 
we stress M1, though I would not recommend it because basically if you are running your shell, then maybe you don't want to remove the wrong file or something like that. So as a conclusion, uh, we've shown that cache cover channels are indeed practical. Uh, even in the clouds, even in presence of really extraordinary, extraordinary noise, uh, we could even uh, support an SSH connection with this cover channel. And as a bonus, we extended Amazon's product portfolio. So we had Amazon Prime, and we now present to you Amazon Prime and Probe. Thank you.